In this video, we're going to talk about Douglas Husak's case for drug decriminalization. Uh, Husak is a professor of law and moral philosophy at Rutgers, and he's written extensively on this topic. And we're going to start with a definition of what we mean by decriminalization, and then look at four arguments that he gives in support of decriminalization. So to begin with definitions, when we talk about decriminalization, we mean that the use of a drug would not be a criminal offense, the use of a drug. And by, by saying that it's not a criminal offense, the main implication here is that um, no government is going to punish the use of a drug if it's decriminalized. Now, um, th that's not to say that uh, the production and sale of drugs would be legalized. There's a big difference between legalization in this sense and decriminalization. This is only about you possessing and using drugs as an individual, not about whether it can be corporately manufactured by big pharma and sold to you at, you know, CVS or in Target or, um, you know, your liquor store. Let's get some beer and heroin. Um, that's not on the table for Husak in this article. He's just talking about whether you personally may possess and use. Now, you may wonder, well, wait a minute. If he wants me to be able to use drugs, but nobody can make it and sell it to me, how am I going to get it? And that's kind of a conversation for a different story, uh, a different time. He's just saying, should we criminally punish people for use and possession? He says no. Now, the first argument that you might make in support of this position of decriminalization is utilitarian or broadly consequentialist. And it goes like this. Premise one, no law should be enacted unless that law works. Pause right there. What do we mean when we say a law works? Well, for HUSAC, that means that it reduces the occurrence of the prohibited conduct and it does so without creating unintended side effects that are even worse than that conduct which it's preventing. So basically the cost benefit analysis works out. So no law should be enacted unless it's got a good cost benefit analysis, socially speaking. Well, he says, drug laws don't work in that sense and therefore they shouldn't be enacted, they should be repealed. So let's look at each one of the key premises here. The first premise is that no law should be enacted unless it works. That is, unless the benefits outweigh the costs. And he says, this is not true in the case of uh, laws that criminalize drug use. He says, there's not much benefit. Drug use is not reduced much by these laws. People are still doing a lot of drugs. And there's a lot of social costs, he says. There's erosion of our privacy and civil liberties. Why? Because uh, the police can search you and search your property for possession of drugs. There's the health risk of an unregulated drug market. The fact that drugs are, are illegal means that they can't be uh, regulated by the FDA in the same way that, you know, other products like your, your Tylenol are regulated. And that causes big uh, health problems because there's all kinds of stuff in your drugs. Maybe there's fentanyl in it. Uh, maybe there's, uh, you know, the dosage is off or something like that. It produces violence south of the U.S. border. Why? Because it incentivizes this illicit cartel-driven drug trade. And there's a high cost of enforcement, enforcing these laws. And there's a social justice issue, he says, because Blacks and Hispanics are far more likely to be punished for drug use and drug uh, possession than white people. Uh, then there's, uh, here's an objection though that someone might raise to that first premise, okay? Um, the first premise says we shouldn't enact any laws unless it's really worth it, unless there's a, the benefits outweigh the costs. But you might object here and say, no, there's some laws that we should keep on the books even if it's very costly to enforce them, like laws against murder and assaulting people. You can imagine a scenario where, um, you know, in, in trying to prosecute murderers, I don't know, maybe like the mafia or something, causes way more problems 
than it solves. Like more people die trying to hunt down the mafia than the mafia itself kills. It seems like the cost benefit analysis is it, it is uh, not makes it not worth it. But you might say, I don't care. We've got to prosecute murder. It doesn't matter. I don't care about the cost benefit analysis. We're keeping that law on the book, on the books. So that's one objection. Well, the consequentialist might reply here, look, no, that's just not true. If it's not worth it to prosecute murder, then don't prosecute murder. Like take those laws off the books. So they could just double down and say, um, it's, it is all about consequences in the end. It's not about some kind of intrinsic justice issues. And then they might add, look, drug use isn't like murder. It's not the sort of thing which we've got to like hold the line on this at all costs. You're talking about people making decisions about their own bodies. That's a totally different deal. So they might say that. Um, and then you might object to that second premise. The second premise said drug laws don't work. And you might say, well, they work some. I mean, some people don't do drugs because they're illegal. It's doing something. And the reply here is like, well, okay, maybe so. But there are a lot of other things that would be more effective at mitigating drug use than just laws. Now, let's turn to his second argument. And I want to set up this argument by laying out some philosophical principles that it, it presupposes. Um, and I'm drawing these principles from John Stuart Mill, who articulated them very famously in his little book called On, On Liberty. The first is the self-ownership principle, which says, over himself, and over his own body and mind, the individual is sovereign. I own myself. And because I own myself, nobody can tell me what to do with myself unless I'm hurting somebody else. This is a harm principle. Uh, Mill says the sole end, the only reason for which mankind are warranted, justified, either individually or collectively, in interfering with the liberty of action of any of their number is self-protection. In other words, the only justification for anybody getting up in your business is if you're hurting other people. If you're hurting yourself or just being a bad person all by yourself and nobody else is affected, nobody has a right to mess with you. That's the harm principle. Now, if you buy into those principles, and many Americans are very attracted to the harm principle uh, and the self-ownership idea, you know, we're all about liberty, don't tread on me, that kind of stuff. Uh, if you're if you buy those principles, you got an argument to legalize drugs. Here's how it goes. Um, if a law violates the harm principle, then that law is unjust. But premise two: laws that prohibit personal drug use violate the harm principle. Why? Because drug use doesn't harm other people. At most, it harms the user, and therefore. Laws that prohibit personal drug use are unjust. Now, let's look at some objections we might make to both of the key premises here. First of all, you might just say the harm principle is false. The state, that is the government, may punish immoral acts. It's perfectly legitimate to punish immoral actions, even if they don't harm other people. Even if you're just being a terrible person all by your lonesome, that can still be illegal. Uh, and the reply here is like, look, that's just not the job of the state. Like somebody who's really committed to the harm principle might say, the government is not here to make me a good person or to make me live a good life. The government is here to protect my rights as a citizen. Those are two totally different things. That's the kind of yeah, libertarian-ish response that someone might give. Well, what about that second premise that we have? The second premise that said, look, drug use doesn't hurt anybody else. It only hurts the user. Well, you might say drug use does result in harm to other people besides the users. And if you, uh, many of my students, uh, people very close to them in their lives have had drug addiction issues. And they often say, let me tell you about the harm that does, it ruins people's lives. And here's what um, USAC wants to say. Drug use doesn't directly harm other people. Uh, for example, you know, if I, take, if I take heroin or meth or something like that, Taking the drug in and of itself doesn't hurt anybody else. It's not like when I when I shoot up, somebody across the room it experiences pain. No, what happens is um, I you know I take the drug and then I do stuff that hurts other people. But it's my actions, not the drug use itself, which is hurting other people. 
Uh, so it's, it's an indirect connection. If I go off in the woods in a cabin somewhere all by myself, uh, you know, I'm not going to hurt anybody else. So it goes the argument. Anyway, he says, even if you do take drugs and do something bad to somebody else, we should punish you for the action that you actually did that harmed them, not the drug use, which may have been indirectly connected. That's his, his reply here. Well, there's a lot here to think about. Do you buy into the fundamental ideas uh, that undergird uh, the, the harm principle, the self-ownership principle, and, and the argument that flows from it? Let's look at the third argument, though, for a second. When this is a, a fairly straightforward one, the idea is that there's no good arguments for criminalizing drug use. And if there's no good arguments in favor of criminalizing drug use, it shouldn't be criminalized. Now, this is an interesting argument. It's hard to prove a negative, but what HUSAC wants to do is say, look, here's the alleged reasons which people give for criminalization, and I think they all stink, says HUSAC. So, you know, people say it's bad for children and adolescents. It's unhealthy. It's correlated with criminal behavior. Use would sky skyrocket if we decriminalize. And he actually, at this point in his essay, he doesn't spell out why really, but he just says, if you dig into the details of these reasons, they all fall apart. Now, you know, that calls for more research because he just kind of hand waves at that point and probably would take a longer essay or book, which of course he's written to unpack why he thinks these are all actually not good reasons to criminalize. Let's move on though to his fourth and final re uh, argument for decriminalizing. He wants to say, first of all, no state, that is no government, um, should punish people for engaging in conduct that is morally permissible. That seems sensible. You shouldn't punish people for doing stuff that's morally unobjectionable. The interesting thing he wants to say is here that the use of at least certain kinds of drugs is morally permissible. Therefore, no state should punish people for using at least certain kinds of drugs. Now, this is an interesting argument um, because he wants, he just says, look, people haven't really given very good moral arguments against drug use. Like, well, what's wrong with it? What could be wrong with it? I mean, think about it. The reason people take drugs is because they make them feel awesome, right? People experience euphoric pleasure when they take drugs. Maybe those pleasures outweigh the, the, the risk or cost for somebody. And like he said, arguably other people aren't harmed. This is all about what you're doing to yourself. So, you know, if you got something that makes people happy, could be worth it to them. What's wrong? What's the harm in that? Some people like to bungee jump. Some people like to parachute. You know, um, there's risks involved. We're all doing some risk calculation. Some people like to do heroin. It's a different risk calculation, but, you know, um, there's, it's not intrinsically wrong, he wants to say. Now, that's a really interesting claim to think about. Um, is it, is drug use, is it just, is it morally permissible? Is it ever morally imp impermissible? We're not talking about the law here. We're talking about the morality of it, regardless of the law. Here's some things to think about. Um, some potential objections that someone might make. You know, does drug use handicap your ability to make moral judgments yourself or to perform your duties? Does it reduce your capacity to enjoy other good things or to sustain your relationships? Does it produce an enslaving dependency? Does it discourage you from re responsibly facing life's difficulties and challenges? Does it produce a happiness that's kind of artificial? Are those reasons to think that it might be morally impermissible to take substances that have that effect? Something to think about. 